Hi, very good evening to all of you. I am very, very fine. How are you all? How are you? So, after a long time, but I am super excited to come back and teach for you all. So, I am Dr. Ramya Sri. I'll be teaching obstetrics and gynecology as a rapid revision for uh, you all. So, our target is for the July exam. So, this, whatever I'm teaching you, please try to concentrate for the next two hours. So, today we are going to complete the OBS revision. And tomorrow we are going to complete the gynec revision. So, I just want your undivided attention in this class. So, that, you know, it's just two hours. Today, two hours of OBS. Tomorrow, two hours of gynec. That's all. Okay. So, I want your undivided attention. Yes, uh, we'll try to cover everything, Abhishek. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So, very good evening. Very good evening to all of you. Wonderful. Yes, you will definitely get the PDF. So, Yes, it is a uh, rapid revision for FMG. You'll get the def you'll definitely get the PDF. Uh, post class, I'll share the PDF in uh, Banu sir's Telegram group as well as in my Telegram group. Right? So, you all will get uh, the PDF also. Uh, the written PDF you'll get so that you can just follow it before your exams. Right. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Thank you so much. So, let us start with the session. Let's start with the class. Thank you so much, cross, bar, cross border. So, let us start positive. You know, every day morning when you get up, tell yourself, you can do this. You can do this, right? So, 150 crossing, you can aram to do it and you're definitely going to do it this time. So, you know, 100% you're going to do it. Thank you so much, Fatima. Thank you so much. Okay, so first let us start with the basic placenta. So the description of the placenta has been asked as an MCQ previously. So first let us start with the basic placenta. So human placenta is described as discoidal because it is like a disc. Hemochoroidal because half blood is from the mother, half blood is from the baby. And it is also described as deciduate. It is also described as deciduate. Right. So, I'm not going to take any of your queries for the next 10, uh, next one hour. Afterwards, one hour later, I'll take your queries. Yeah, I'll message you my group name, everything. Don't worry. Just give me some time. So, first, let us start. So, now onwards, for next one hour, please give your undivided attention because I'm squeezing the entire orbs in two hours. So, I think you understand. It's going to be like, you know, a quick recap of everything, whatever you have learned. So, we are going to be pin to pin with the topic. We are going to be pin to pin. This is how the revision should be made. That's how what I'm going to teach you all. Okay? So, they have been asked. So, whatever I'm speaking has been asked as an MCQ. So, I don't require to repeat like this has been come as an ex exam question. Because I have put only those things which have been asked as an MCQs to you all. Right? So, placenta is described as discoid, hemochoroidal and deciduate. Right? So, you have two components of the placenta. Placenta is made up of chorion frondosum and maternal component is decidia basalis. Now, normally placenta, if you see fetal surface is smooth, glistening because it is covered by amnion and in the center, you have the umbilical cord. 
and if the umbilical cord is placed in the lateral if the umbilical cord is placed lateral then you call it as marginal ya battle door placenta maternal surface is divided into multiple lobes which is called as cotyledon normally the diameter of the placenta at term is 15 to 20 cm it is thickness is 2.5 cm and it weighs around 500 grams and it weighs around 500 grams so the uterine blood flow is 800 to 900 ml per minute this has been asked as a question so uterine blood flow at term is 800 to 900 ml per minute whereas utero placental blood flow at term is 450 to 650 ml per minute utero placental blood flow at term is 450 to 650 ml per minute whereas fetal blood flow at term is 400 ml per minute fetal blood flow at term is 400 ml per minute right so these are the important points which you should be knowing with respect to the placenta so now what is an abnormal placenta how do we look how do we have an abnormal placenta so the first placenta what you are seeing here they can give you the image and ask you about the placenta so the first placenta what you are seeing here this is called as extra corial placenta yeah it's also called as circumvallate i call this as pani puri placenta it's looking like a pani puri right so i call it as a pani puri placenta so it has a double fold of amnion and chorion with a central depression so it has a central depression and a double fold of amnion and chorion right so this placenta yes very good S snv prasad so this placenta has increased risk of antepartum hemorrhage preterm labor antepartum hemorrhage preterm labor so what are you going to print in your brain so if you get a placenta which shows a central depression and a double fold of amnion and chorion what is the name which you are going to write in the exam it's called as circumvallate it is called as circumvallate circumvallate circum marginate has only a single fold of amnion and chorion and it has a peripheral margin like this it has a single fold of amnion and chorion and it has a peripheral margin okay that is circum marginate circum marginate now which has been asked as an mcq is this once you got this one as an mcq so when one cotyledon is separate from the entire placenta then one cotyledon is separate from the entire placenta what do you call this placenta as when one cotyledon is separate from the entire placenta what do you call this as but it is connected to it it is connected to it so this is called as succenturate succenturate is associated with vasa previa that is fetal vessels with membranes over the uh, internal os retain placenta pph and sepsis and uterus won't come back to its normal size fast it will take more time so that is called as sub involution that is called as sub involution right next when placenta is divided into two lobes and interconnected this is called as placenta bilobata placenta bilobata next one this is the most important this has been asked as an mcq guys this has been asked as an mcq when cord is attached to membranes but not to the placenta agar cord membranes ko attach hai if placenta if cord is attached to membranes not to the placenta then you call it as velamentous placenta then you call it as velamentous placenta it is called as velamentous placenta why is this most dangerous because this has the risk of fetal hemorrhage so whenever this placenta gets damaged it is fetal hemorrhage which is going to happen so that's why this is dangerous so velamentous placenta or membranous placenta is very important cord is attached to membranes so i hope you all printed this much in your brain next picture this is called as vasa previa let us understand vasa previa so what is vasa previa when fetal vessels with membranes overlie the internal os then we call it as vasa previa fetal vessels with membranes overlie the internal os then we call it as vasa previa vasa previa is also associated with fetal hemorrhage fetal hemorrhage right 
so what is what are the placentas which can cause vasa previa succinctate lobe can cause vasa previa velamentous placenta can cause plas, vasa previa placenta bilobata can cause vasa previa so vasa previa is associated with painless vaginal bleeding and it causes fetal hemorrhage now if fetal vessels with membranes overlie the internal os you call it as vasa previa similarly agar placenta overlies the internal os what do you call that as instead of this vessels with membranes if placenta lies over here then what do you call it as if placenta lies over the internal os you call it as placenta previa you call it as placenta previa right very good very good sangeeta matu so how do we diagnose this this is diagnosed mainly with tvs with doppler management you have to mainly do elective cesarean section one more question which you got is what is morbidly adherent placenta so morbidly adherent placenta is mainly due to absence of nitabux fibrinoid layer morbidly adherent placenta is mainly due to absence of nitabux fibrinoid layer so this nitabux fibrinoid layer is absent that is why placenta goes inside so we have placenta accreta so placenta accreta means a for accreta a means adherent i for increta i means invades the myometrium placenta percreta p for percreta p for penetrates myometrium to reach perimetrium right so morbidly adherent placenta is due to absence of nitabux fibrinoid layer accreta a for accreta adherent to myometrium increta i for increta invades the myometrium percreta p for percreta p for penetrates the myometrium to reach perimetrium means it can go up to bladder also so these are the different types of placentas which can come in the exam to you right now what about placenta previa so very recently you got an mcq last year on placenta previa description so placenta previa also causes so vasa previa was vessels with membranes over the internal os whereas placenta previa is placenta with membrane placenta lying over the internal os so placenta previa can come as an image based question so type 1 placenta previa is placenta lying within 2 cm from the internal os placenta lying within 2 cm from the internal os type 2 or marginal is placenta touching the margin of the os again in type 2 you have type 2a type 2b type 2a and type 2b which is called dangerous guys type 2b is also called as dangerous placenta previa type 2b is also called as dangerous placenta previa so type 2b is posterior type 2a is anterior type 3 is partial type 4 is partially covering the os type 4 is totally covering the os but this is an outdated now the new placenta previa is only low lying that is placenta within 2 cm from the internal os and placenta previa so this also present to you with painless vaginal bleeding now remember guys this will present to you with painless vaginal bleeding after 28 weeks but before delivery but this can also present to you with episodes from the first trimester but diagnosis is usually made beyond 28 weeks although it presents to you with little 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 bleeding from first trimester diagnosis will be made after 28 weeks once you reconfirm the ultrasound whether placenta has moved up or not sometimes placenta can move up right so here uterus is relaxed here uterus will be relaxed unlike abrupt show here uterus will be relaxed right there is one very classical sign with respect to this here bachcha will be mal presentations are frequent and here you have one sign does anybody remember the sign which is present very particular to only placenta previa so you have something called as stalworthy sign that is whenever you push the baby inside the pelvis there will be decrease in the fetal heart rate once you release the release the baby baby's heart beat will become better so when gestational age crosses 37 weeks we go for elective lscs lower segment cesarean section before 37 weeks we can do expectant management and expectant management is called as mcafee and johnson's regimen expectant management here is called as mcafee and johnson's regimen right 
So what do we do in the McAfee and Johnson's regimen? You have to wait and watch up to 37 weeks. But the prerequisites should be mother should be hemodynamically stable and fetus also should be stable. So you give her some bed rest. You give her some steroids for lung maturity. You give steroids to baby for lung maturity. And you will give tocolysis. And you will give tocolysis. In exam, you are always confused between placenta previa and abruption. You are always confused between placenta previa and abruption. So how are you going to differentiate between placenta previa and abruption? So basically, they will be third trimester bleedings. And one very, very, very key important point, placenta previa is painless bleeding, whereas abruptio is painful bleeding. Abruptio is painful bleeding. That is the main key point, right? So, in abruption, you have variety. So, abruption is premature separation of normally situated placenta. Premature separation of normally situated placenta. Then, placenta gets separated and the blood comes out like this. This is called as revealed. Then, placenta gets separated and... The blood is accumulated behind the placenta and this blood can seep inside to the muscle and yes, you also call it as covalar uterus. Concealed abruption can present you with covalar uterus. Very good, excellent. So, abruptio may bleeding will be painful and painful bleeding, painful so, placenta previa, bleeding is painless and profuse, whereas abruptio may it will be painful. Placenta previa, bleeding is always revealed. Abruptio may it can be revealed, concealed or mixed. Abruptio is usually progressive. It goes on increasing. But placenta previa, the bleeding happens in bouts. Now, bleeding has happened, it can stop like that. So, pallor will be proportional to the visible blood loss in placenta previa. But in concealed abruption, it is out of proportion to the ble be visible bleeding. Pallor will be more because bleeding is not occurring in concealed. Right? Most of the time in abruptio, you can have preeclampsia. Most of the time in abruptio, you can have underlying preeclampsia. This point is also important. In abruptio, you can have underlying preeclampsia. Uterus will be proportioned to the height of the height uh, of period of gestation. Mal presentations are frequent in placenta previa, whereas in abruption, uterus is tonically contracted and tender. Uterus is tonically contracted and tender. In, in placenta previa, placenta is in the lower segment, whereas in abruption, it is in the upper segment. Never, never, never give tocolysis in abruption. Again, one more important point. I think you are listening. Tocolysis should not be given in abruption. Tocolysis can be given in placenta previa and that is what is called as McAfee and Johnson's regimen, right? So, delivery is mainly by LSCS in uh, placenta previa, whereas it can be LSCS or vaginal delivery in abruptio. One more MCQ, guys. The most common cause of DIC in pregnancy is abruptio. The most common cause of DIC in pregnancy is abruptio. Most common cause of DIC in, ab DIC in pregnancy is abruptio, okay? So, how do we deal with the abruptio? So, abruptio, you have to check the baby's status. If baby is alive and if there is fetal distress, you go for LSCS. If there is no fetal distress, then you can go for vaginal delivery. If baby is alive and fetal distress is present, go for LSCS. If there is no fetal distress, then you will go for vaginal delivery. If baby is dead, you check the maternal status because it can cause DIC. If there is no DIC, then you go for vaginal delivery. If there is DIC, correct the DIC and then go for vaginal delivery. Okay. So, that's about the abruptio and placenta previa. Let us see one MCQ. A primary gravida presents to casualty at 35 weeks of gestation with acute pain abdomen for 2 hours. Vaginal bleeding and decreased fetal movements. She should be managed by. So, what is the diagnosis here? What is the diagnosis? 35 weeks with acute pain abdomen for 2 hours, vaginal bleeding and decreased fetal movements. What is the diagnosis? Is this abruptio or is this placenta previa? Whenever you are getting a clinical based question, always first ask yourself what is the diagnosis. Then you can go for the management. 
yes i will send the pdf post class to all of you don't worry about the pdf 100% i'll send so this is abrupt show this is abruption because they are telling that it is a painful bleeding hai na i told you an abruption only when will you do cesarean section when there is fetal distress you will do cesarean section here they mentioned there is decreased fetal movements but they didn't tell that there is fetal distress so what should be the management you cannot give tocolysis you will not give magnesium sulfate as it is only decreased fetal movements but there is no fetal distress the better answer will be immediate induction of labor immediate induction of labor right next question a lady with 35 weeks pregnancy presented with bleeding for vagina investigation shows severe degree of placenta previa means it is third four degree uh, four degree of placenta previa the treatment is up to how many weeks we can wait and watch sangeeta up to how many weeks we can wait and watch in placenta previa up to how many weeks we can do mckefi and johnson's regimen in placenta previa we can do mckefi and johnson's regimen up to 37 weeks and this patient is only 35 weeks so do you want to wait on her or do you want to deliver her do you want to wait on her or do you want to deliver her so as she is still 35 weeks i would like to wait on her so that is why i am going to go for conservative management so i told you if she is hemodynamically stable we can always wait and watch here i just told it is severe degree of placenta previa i didn't say there is severe bleeding normally students interpret in their brain thinking that i am telling it is severe degree of placenta pre severe bleeding but i didn't tell it is severe bleeding i just told baby is having uh, there is only severe degree of placenta previa and she came at 35 weeks with my with bleeding for vagina i didn't tell patient is hemodynamically unstable or anything like that so that is why we can wait up to 37 weeks so very good pile uh, so the answer is conservative management right so next let us go to the umbilical cord so normally the umbilical cord is 30 to 70 cm normally the umbilical cord is 30 to 70 cm so you have two arteries and one vein very very important we have two umbilical arteries and one vein what carries oxygenated blood from mother to fetus is it a artery or a vein so it is the vein which carries the oxygenated this has been asked as an mcq umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood blood from the mother to fetus whereas umbilical artery will carry deoxygenated blood from fetus to mother okay the most common vascular anomaly associated in umbilical cord is single umbilical artery so single umbilical artery is seen in black race diabetics epileptics eclampsia patients most common aneuploidy associated with single umbilical artery is trisomy 18 most common congenital malformation associated with single umbilical artery is cardiovascular more than renal cardiovascular ren more than renal right these are the th two important points you should be knowing with respect to umbilical cord so when we are revising it should be like precise like what is the most important that we have to revise next very important is we should know how to calculate the how to calculate the expected date of delivery so normally expected date of delivery is calculated by negley's formula by add by for a 28 day cycle it is 9 months plus 7 days what we calculate from the lmp so for example if lmp is fifteenth june when will be the edd for a 28 day cycle yes so nagley's formula is 9 months plus 7 days so if lmp is 15th june when will be the edd guys for a 28 day cycle so 9 months plus 7 days or you can also do minus 3 months 
I am little poor in math, so six plus nine months is very difficult for me. Six minus three months is very simple. So you know, March next year baby will be born, so twenty twenty four, and uh, fifteen plus seven will give. Fifteen plus seven is fifteen plus seven is twenty two. So the expected date of delivery will be twenty second March. The expected date of delivery will be twenty second March. Correct. Now. If she has number of cycles, the days of the cycles are increasing. Like if she has thirty days of cycles, then you have to add two more days to this. So it will become thirtieth March. No, sorry, twenty fourth March. Similarly, if she has twenty six days cycle, you subtract two days. You subtract two days, so it will become twenty March. So depending on how many days more from the 28 days those many days you have to add or depending on how many days less those many days you have to subtract this is one more thing which you should know now so i hope you all know nagli's formula and you can calculate the expected date of delivery now if they have irregular cycles then we go for ultrasound on ultrasound in first trimester we measure the crown rump length we measure the crown rump length so crown rump length plus or minus 1 week will give us crown rump length Will give us expected date of delivery plus or minus one week. This is the crown rump length from the head to the rump of the baby. Second trimester we we mainly measure the biparietal diameter. It will be plus or minus two weeks difference. Third trimester we measure the femoral length that will give us plus or minus three weeks, but that is not very effective way. So how do we estimate the fetal weight? We estimate the fetal weight by checking the abdominal circumference. So third trimester is not good for the Estimating gestational age. Third trimester is good for checking the baby's weight. Kisi ka weight, how do you find out by seeing their weight? So estimate the fetal weight by checking the abdominal circumference in third trimester. An abdominal circumference is more than thirty-five centimeters. We call it macrosomia. So what did I teach you here now? What did we recap here? So how do we calculate the expected date of delivery? It is calculated by Nagli's formula. That is. Plus nine months, plus seven days from the LMP for a twenty-eight days regular cycle. But somebody has irregular cycles, you can use the crown rump. You can use the ultrasound. Ultrasound in a way, first trimester crown rump length is the most accurate way of estimating the gestational age. That's all, right? Next, let's go to the yeah, obstetric score. This can pakka pakka come in the exam, guys. So you should be in a position to answer for obstetric score. Okay? so what does gravida means so gravida means total number of pregnancies whether it was aborted whether it was alive uh, doesn't matter so total number of pregnancies together we call it as gravida whereas para means only those pregnancies which have crossed the period of viability and para does not include the current pregnancy for twins gravida and para will be one or two guys For twins, gravida and para will be one or two. Please remember, twin ka pregnancy also nine months itself. So twins is gravida and para one itself, not two. So let us do this question. A middle-aged woman came to the OPD with a twin pregnancy. She already had two first trimester abortions. She has a three-year-old female child who was born at the end of ninth month of gestation. Which of the following is her accurate representation? So, guys, what is your answer for this? So, how many times totally she got pregnant? She is now currently with twin pregnancy, which we are going to consider single gravida. She had two abortions. She already has one baby. So, she is gravida four. How many pregnancies have crossed the period of viability? Only one pregnancy, which she delivered at the end of ninth month. So para one, para one, right? And how many abortions she had? Two abortions. So A two. How many living child she has? L one. So G four, P one, A two, L one. So please remember this: gravida will be always more compared to para. Gravida will be always more compared to para. 
क्योंकि ग्राविडा इंक्लूड करेंट प्रेगनेंसी पैरा डज नॉट इंक्लूड करेंट प्रेगनेंसी सो द आंसर विल बी जी फोर पी वन एल वन ए टू करेक्ट गाइस ऑल ऑफ यू अंडरस्टूड दिस कैन कम दिस सिमिलर टू दिस कैन कम सो ग्राविडा मतलब टोटल नंबर ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी इज इेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ द आउटकम वेदर इट इज अलाइव और डेट डजेंट मैटर एंड इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड द करेंट प्रेगनेंसी Para means only those pregnancies which have crossed a period of viability. It can be either 24 or 28, depending on your MCQ. Para does not include current pregnancy. Para will include only पीछे का pregnancies. Abortion all those pregnancies which have ended before 24 weeks. Okay. Right. Next, let us go to the. So, preterm means less than 37 weeks. Early term means 37 to early term means 37 to 38 plus six weeks. Mid term is 39 to 40 plus six weeks. Late term is 41 to 42 weeks. As well as post term is beyond 42 weeks. Post term is beyond 42 weeks. Any elective cesarean sections should be done in mid term. Any elective cesarean section. Uh, any elective cesarean section should be done in mid term okay yes roy very good correct so now coming to the trimesters so how many trimesters do we have in pregnancy now how many trimesters do we have in pregnancy now again all these has been asked as an mcq so we uh, just try to grasp it now itself print kar lo brain mein theek hai so on the whole we are having totally four trimesters now earlier it was three trimesters but now it is four trimester three is over now everything in ops is four guys first trimester is up to 14 weeks second trimester is up to 28 weeks third trimester is up to 42 weeks every trimester is 14 14 weeks we have new one that is fourth trimester fourth trimester is postpartum up to 12 weeks postpartum up to 12 weeks The minimum number of ANCs which should which which we should have is in India four. According to WHO, if they ask the MCQ like this, according to WHO, what should be the minimum number of ANC visits? Then you should answer it as eight. So according to India, it is four ANC visits. According to WHO, it is minimum eight ANC visits. Ideal number are twelve. So once in four weeks up to twenty eight weeks. Once in four weeks up to twenty eight weeks. Once in two weeks, up to thirty-six weeks, and thereafter weekly. So ideal will be twelve to fifteen. Once in four weeks, up to twenty-eight weeks. Once in two weeks, up to thirty-six weeks, thereafter weekly. How many doses of vaccine we should give? Two doses of TD. In India, we are giving now free TD. It is not TT anymore. It is how much? It is TD. So two doses of TD, four weeks apart. And other optional vaccines, but the बहुत पैसा है. So then you can give us one flu shot, flu vaccine, especially in winters, COVID vaccine, and one dose of Tdap. Tdap is tetanus, diphtheria, ursula pertussis between 27 to 32 weeks of gestation. Right? Clear? Now, what are the vaccines which can be given in pregnancy? What are the vaccines which are contraindicated in pregnancy? Remember, guys, all the live vaccines can be given in pregnancy. All the live vaccines can be given in pregnancy. Sorry, all the live vaccines are contraindicated in pregnancy, whereas all the killed vaccines can be given in the pregnancy. So, so my mnemonic of killed vaccine, how you can remember is Mar Hit Rabies. So, M meningococcal, H hepatitis B, influenza, T Dap Rabies. This can be given in pregnancy because all these are killed. PCG, MMR, varicella, smallpox, oral polio should not be given because these are live vaccines. Japanese encephalitis and yellow fever can be given if she is traveling to endemic areas. Japanese encephalitis and yellow fever can be given if she is traveling to endemic areas. Otherwise, these also should not be given because these are also live vaccines. So all live vaccines are contraindicated, whereas killed vaccines can be given. Okay. next very important is regarding calories so regarding calories first trimester don't give any calories zero kilo calories second trimester because she is puking no so don't force her anything second trimester plus 350 third trimester plus 450 lactation may plus 600 kilo calories right 
आयरन आयरन वी गिव एज पर अनिमिया मुक्त भारत सो आयरन सिक्सटी मिलीग्राम्स ऑफ एलिमेंटल आयरन प्लस फिफ्टी माइक्रोग्राम्स ऑफ फोलिक एसिड फॉर वन एटी डेज इन प्रेगनेंसी एंड वन एटी डेज पोस्टमार्टम सो सिक्सटी मिलीग्राम्स ऑफ एलिमेंटल आयरन प्लस फाइव हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम्स फाइव हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम्स ऑफ फोलिक एसिड फॉर वन एटी डेज इन प्रेगनेंसी एंड वन एटी डेज पोस्टमार्टम सिंपल नाउ रिगार्डिंग द फोलिक एसिड सो फोलिक एसिड इज स्टार्टेड इन द फर्स्ट टाइम स्टर आइडियली इट शुड बी स्टार्टेड थ्री मंथ प्रायर और एटलीस्ट वन मंथ प्रायर प्रोफाइल एक्टिक डोज एज पर डब्ल्यू एच ओ इज फोर हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम्स एज पर इंडिया इट इज फाइव हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम्स थेरापेटिक डोज इज एज पर डब्ल्यू एच ओ फोर मिलीग्राम्स एज पर इंडिया फाइव मिलीग्राम्स वेर डू वी गिव द थेरापेटिक डोज दिस हेज बीन आज एज एन एम सी क्यू फॉर यू गाइज सो थेरापेटिक डोज शुड बी गिवन वेन दे हैव प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री ऑफ न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट्स फैमिली हिस्ट्री ऑफ न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट्स थैलेसीमिया सिकल सेल अनिमिया एंड एपिलेप्सी प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री या फैमिली हिस्ट्री ऑफ न्यूरल ट्यूब डिफेक्ट्स थैलेसीमिया सिकल सेल अनिमिया एंड एपिलेप्सी कैल्शियम शुड बी स्टार्टेड इन दैकेंड ट्राइमस्टर कैल्शियम इज थाउजेंड मिलीग्राम्स पर डे पोस्ट पार्टम इट इज थाउजेंड टू ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड मिलीग्राम्स पर डे वाइटामिन डी डोज इज सिक्स हंड्रेड इंटरनेशनल यूनिट्स पर डे वाइटामिन डी इज सिक्स हंड्रेड इंटरनेशनल यूनिट्स पर डे राइट What are the investigations which we are going to do at the first visit? So you have to do blood grouping and typing, complete blood picture, serum TSH, blood sugars. So serum TSH is very important because uh, if they are hypothyroid, if mother is hypothyroid, it can cause mental retardation in the fetus. That's called cretinism. So serum TSH has to be corrected. Blood sugars at the first visit and repeat again at 24 to 28 weeks. Complete blood picture should be done in every trimester. HIV, HBSAG, and VDRL also is to be done. Urine, routine, and microscopy also in every trimester. And Pap smear, but we don't do it. So that's about the pregnancy and antenatal care, which are most important points which you all should be knowing, and all the drug names, all the drug dosages which you should be knowing. So I hope uh, it has striked in your brain whatever I discussed till now. Right now, coming to aneuploidy and aneuploidy screening. So 13 ke age me patana. Trisomy 13 is patau. So I have seen some of your question papers where they will give uh, karyotype ka picture, chromosomes ka picture, and you know at 13 there will be three chromosomes. Then you have to answer it is trisomy 13. Similarly at 21 if you have three chromosomes it is Down's. 18 if you have three chromosomes it is Edward. So 13 ke age me patana. 18 ke age me Edward. 21 ke age me settle down. Right. so baby is dependent on the mother's iodine for the first and second trimester so this is the query i'm answering for right so baby is dependent on maternal iodine for the first and second trimester third trimester baby can prepare its own uh, thyroid hormone so aneuploidy screening may first trimester we mainly screen with combined screening method so what is a combined screening method combined screening method i i remember it as like this so combined screening method may you have double marker plus nt scan and when you use double marker plus nt scan detection rate is 82 to 84% so how are you going to remember the double marker plus nt scan beta papa aunty so beta papa aunty combination rocks in the first trimester so beta papa and aunty combination rocks in the first trimester so that will give you the detection rate of 82 to 84% that will give you the detection rate of 82 to 84% so nt should be less than 3 mm nt should be less than 3 mm okay that is nuckel translucency so this is the nt scan so nt scan is done when uh, between when when gestational age is between 11 to 14 weeks of gestation when crown rump length is between 45 to 84 mm neck should be in neutral position it should neither be extended nor be flexed and when you are doing the nt scan you should see two you should see two parallel lines in the nose you should see two parallel lines in the nose and the translucent area in the neck will be visible and you will be seeing a translucent area in the neck which should be less than 3 mm which should be less than 3 mm right next coming to the second trimester screening method so second trimester's may screening method is 
which we do between 15 to 20 weeks of gestation so here we mainly do the quadruple marker so quadruple marker is beta hcg inhibin a alpha beta protein and unconjugated estriol for downs beta hcg and inhibin a increases h for high i for increase alpha beta protein and unconjugated estriol will decrease whereas for edward syndrome everything will decrease for edward syndrome everything will decrease okay guys so what is it what is the screening method in the first trimester the screening method in the first trimester was beta papa anti second trimester mein beta hcg inhibin a it is inhibin a alpha fetoprotein and unconjugated estriol this is called quadruple marker if any of these screening methods are abnormal then we go for something which has 99% detection rate that's called nipt non invasive prenatal testing or uh, where we use the cell free fetal dna that is 99% effective that is 99% effective if if this is also abnormal then you go for invasive methods in exam you should be in a position to identify the images of the invasive method so if you see this image where is the needle going here needle is going into the placenta so what do you call this method as guys can you answer what do you call this method as so if you get this image you should be in a position to answer guys so here the needle is going into the placenta so that is why this is called as chorionic villus sampling this is called as chorionic villus sampling chorionic villus sampling is done between chorionic villus sampling is done between 10 to 13 weeks here we mainly pick up the trophoblasts here we mainly pick up the trophoblasts so culture results will come within one week and abortion rate is less than 0.5% right very good so next picture if you see here the needle is going and pricking the amniotic fluid so this is called as amniocentesis all these are invasive methods but these are confirmatory methods right so amniocentesis may it is done between 15 to 20 weeks you check the fetal amniocyte that is fetal skin epithelial cells fetal skin epithelial cells culture results will come within one week abortion rate is again less than 0.5% next comes the chordocentesis here you are taking the fetal blood from the umbilical cord so chordocentesis is done between 18 to 20 weeks of gestation here you take the fetal wbcs culture results the results are very fast here within 48 hours but the abortion rate is maximum here it is 2 to 3% it is 2 to 3% right so that's about the that's about the uh, confirmatory method so what did we learn there see everywhere you have to just keep key points in your brain i taught you combined screening method i taught you nt scan i taught you double mark uh, quadruple marker nipt then chorionic villus sampling amniocentesis chordocentesis now answer this question guys what is the optimum method of screening for chromosomal abnormality in a pregnancy at 13 weeks of gestation what is the optimum method of screening for chromosomal abnormality in a pregnancy at 13 weeks of gestation first and foremost they are asking screening so first option i would like to rule out in exam you try to do ruling out like this then it will be easy for you so as they are asking screening method i am ruling out first option that is amniocentesis kyunki amniocentesis is not screening it is a confirmatory method right next they are asking at how many weeks of gestation they are asking at 13 weeks of gestation so as they are asking at 13 weeks i will not go with quadruple test because quadruple test is done between 15 to 20 weeks of gestation right next nipt is never a primary test it should be done after the screening now between knuckle translucency and combined screening combined screening is a more better answer so that is why you are all correct in answering second one as the correct answer that is combined screening method okay so i hope you will be able to answer when you get a question on this next chapter let us go to the next very important chapter where you got multiple questions in your exam miscarriage miscarriage 
So according to miscarriage means pregnancy loss before period of before period of viability. Now according to Indian Academy of Pediatrics, period of viability is 24 weeks. So if you have if you have pregnancy loss before 24 weeks, according to Indian Academy of Pediatrics, it's called miscarriage or less than 500 grams when it is not capable of independent survival. According to clinically in our hospitals, whenever pregnancy loss before 28 weeks, we call it as abortion. But according to Indian Academy of Pediatrics, it is 24 weeks. Which are most common first trimester year, second trimester? First trimester abortions are more common compared to second trimester abortions. So most common first trimester abortion is mainly due to genetic. Most common first trimester abortion is mainly due to genetic. Most common first trimester abortion is mainly due to genetic, which can be both euploidy and aneuploidy, which are both euploidy and aneuploidy. Most common aneuploidy causing abortion, it is autosomal trisomy. Guys, understand this. Most common cause, most common aneuploidy leading to abortion is autosomal trisomy. And most common autosomal trisomy which leads to abortion is trisomy 16. Most specific cause for first trimester abortion is Turner's. Most specific cause for first trimester abortion is Turner's. Most common cause for second trimester abortion is anatomical abnormalities like uterine abnormalities. Most common cause of recurrent abortion is idiopathic. Recurrent means when they have more than or equal to three abortions, we call it as recurrent. So what did we all learn here? There is a there is something which we have learned here. Most common cause of first trimester abortion is genetic abnormalities. Most common aneuploidy which leads to first trimester abortion is autosomal trisomy. Most specific cause is Turner's. Most common cause of uh, second trimester abortion is anatomical abnormality. And single most common cause will be cervical incompetence. Most common cause of recurrent abortion is idiopath, idiopathic 50%. Autoimmune also will lead to 18 to 20 percent. Autoimmune can also lead to abortions. Autoimmune means mainly APLA. Then anatomical, genetic and endocrinal. All these can lead to recurrent abortions. When you have more than three abortions, we call it as recurrent abortions. Now, single most common cause for recurrent abortion is APLA. Single most common cause for recurrent abortion is APLA. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. The management for APLA is Low molecular weight aparin plus aspirin. Low molecular weight aparin plus aspirin. Okay. Yeah. Torch will never cause recurrent abortion. Torch infections will never cause recurrent abortion. The only organism which can cause recurrent abortion is syphilis. That too which syphilis? Congenital syphilis. So congenital syphilis follows something called as Cassavitz law. Cassavitz law. So what is this Cassavitz law? With every pregnancy loss, gestational age will improve. So now if she has an abortion at 14 weeks, next she'll have abortion at 28 weeks. Then she'll have a stillbirth. Then she'll have a abnormal baby. One fine day she'll have a normal baby. That doesn't mean don't treat syphilis, treat syphilis. Okay. But yes, it improves by itself. Okay. So, most common cause of abortion is overfeeder factor, maternal hypoxia, uterine fibroid, cervical incompetence. Please answer this question, guys. So, most common cause of abortion is first trimester. First trimester may most common is mainly due to genetic. So, genetic means what is the other name for genetic? Ovo fetal factors. So the answer here is A. Now don't worry because of the questions which I kept. I usually discuss difficult questions. Right. Now next very important which we are going to discuss is regarding the types of abortion. Now the classical triad of abortion is the classical triad of abortion is amenorrhea, bleeding per vaginum and pain abdomen. Amenorrhea, bleeding per vaginum and pain abdomen. So what are the classical triad guys? Amenorrhea, bleeding per vaginum and pain abdomen. 
Among amenorrhea, bleeding per vagina and pain abdomen, which is the predominant symptom, guys? Which is the predominant symptom? Is it amenorrhea? Is it bleeding per vagina? Yeah, is it pain abdomen? So, the predominant symptom is bleeding per vagina. The predominant symptom is bleeding per vagina. So, threatened abortion may, it is just scaring you, but it will not get aborted. So, uterus will be equal to period of amenorrhea. Uterus will be equal to period of amenorrhea. Os will be closed. Management is wait and watch. Classical triad is mild uh, bleeding, mild pain. Right? Inevitable abortion means the process of abortion has gone to that stage where you cannot reverse it back. So, here also they will have amenorrhea, bleeding and pain. Uterus will be equal to period of amenorrhea. Os is open. But no products have come out. So, management is wait and watch and you can or you can go for MTP. Sorry, management you mainly remember it as MTP. You have to terminate the pregnancy, right? Incomplete abortion means the process of abortion has gone to that state. Here some products have gone out and some products are still inside. So, clinical picture, amenorrhea, bleeding, pain of demand. As some products have gone out, uterus will be less than period of amenorrhea, less than period of amenorrhea. Os also will be open. Here also we will go for MTP. Next, complete abortion, everything has gone out. So, pain and bleeding, all this time which you got is subsided. Pain and bleeding have subsided. Uterus will be less than period of amenorrhea. Uterus will be less than period of amenorrhea. And os is closed because everything has gone out. So, plus or minus you can give antibiotics. Missed abortion means it's a dead fetus lying inside the uterus. So, you will have a brownish discharge. Uterus can be equal to your less than period of amenorrhea. Os is closed. You have to go for MT. It's not a ultrasound. It's not a clinical finding. It is mainly ultrasound finding. Okay, so on the whole, these all types of abortion, which are the two types of abortion where OS is open? What are the only two abortions where OS is open? So, missed abortion, how do you, I, how do, how, what is the way of telling that it is a missed abortion? When on ultrasound, you have done scan and scan has shown crown rump length of more than 7 mm but no FHR, then you call it as a missed abortion. Yeah, mean sac diameter more than 25 mm, but no embryo, you call it as a missed abortion. So, crown rump length more than 7 mm, but no heartbeat. Yeah, mean sac diameter more than 25 mm with no embryo, you call it as a missed abortion. Okay, these two are important which you remember. Right? Next, coming to MTP. MTP is also very, very important, guys. So, I asked you one question. What are the only two abortions where OS is open? What is the only two abortions where OS is open? The only two abortions where OS is open is, yes, both which are starting with I. Both which are starting with I. That is incomplete and inevitable. Incomplete and inevitable, right? Okay, so the new MTP bill has come at 2021 and came into effect from March 2021. The indications are important, has been asked as an MCQ to you. So, indications of MTP are to save the life of the mother, like mother is having some cyanotic heart disease, yeah, mother is having a chronic kidney disease, immunosuppression. So, to save the life of the mother, eugenic, genetic causes, humanitarian, rape, incest, contraception failure and where you continue the pregnancy, it can cause grief injury to the mental and physical health of mother. So, these are the indications for MTP. Please remember guys, this has been asked as an MCQ. So, to save the life of the mother, eugenic, humanitarian ground that is rape and incest, contraception failure and when you continue the pregnancy, when it causes grief injury to the mental and physical health of the mother. So, what are the new updates we have? Very wonderful updates. So, now termination is up to 24 weeks. But for whom? Only for the eugenic and humanitarian ground. So, only for eugenic and humanitarian ground, it is 24 weeks. It is still 20 weeks for contraception failure. 
for contraception failure the upper limit of termination is 20 weeks and when you have a lethal anomalies or substantial fetal anomalies like you know anencephaly ya caudal regression syndrome uh, dandy walker where you know life is not possible at all then substantial anomalies no upper limit substantial anomalies no upper limit one doctor opinion up to 20 weeks two doctor opinion from 20 to 24 weeks so one doctor opinion up to 20 weeks two doctor opinion from 20 to 24 weeks privacy of the women will be maintained you will not tell women's name or write women's name anywhere and now earlier it was only married woman and her partner who can come for termination but now woman and her partner can come it's no need a married woman even unmarried woman we do mtp good na so these are the new updates so i hope you are clear with the new updates so termination has been changed up to 24 weeks only for eugenic and humanitarian not for everyone only for eugenic and humanitarian termination is up to 20 weeks for contraception failure substantial anomalies no upper limit one doctor opinion up to 20 weeks two doctor opinion 20 to 24 weeks privacy will be maintained and women and her partner can come no need of married women right who can do the mtps only a qualified person who has a degree or diploma in opca and who has assisted 25 mtps or who has done 6 months of internship so mtp should be done only in hospitals or established by government or approved by government consent of the woman is enough not wife consent of the woman is enough in minors guardian consent will be taken and abort all abortions have to be reported to the government now mtp methods are also very important many mcqs have been asked so before you perform any mtp you should always 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 get a scan after that you do mtp so according to williams day 1 may be 200 mg per oral day 2 after 24 hours you have to give misoprostol 800 micrograms 800 micrograms misoprostol or you can give misoprostol alone also if you are giving misoprostol alone it is 800 micrograms and then you repeat it every 3 hours total 3 doses then you repeat every 3 hours total 3 doses but in india what do we do in india day 1 mifi day 3 misoprostol 800 micrograms per vaginal that is the only difference between williams and india williams may it is day 2 in india it is day 1 mifi pristone please guys print it this in your brain day 1 mifepristone 200 mg per oral day 3 misoprostol 800 mg per vaginal 98% effective after 2 weeks you call her and do a ultrasound to see whether all products have gone out or not so this is about the first trimester method coming to the second trimester methods coming to the second trimester method so second trimester may you can do day 1 mifi and day 2 misoprostol 400 micrograms every 3 hours up to 5 total doses you got this question in your exam ki misoprostol how many doses we can give maximum 5 doses in the second trimester or in second trimester you can give only misoprostol when you are giving only misoprostol it is 400 micrograms every 3 hours up to 5 doses so you can give day 1 mifepristone 200 mg per oral and after 24 hours misoprostol every 3 hours Five, uh, four hundred micrograms, five doses. Yeah, you can give misoprostol four hundred micrograms every three hours, five doses. Apart from that, you have intra-amniotic installation of hypotonic urea and normal saline, extra-amniotic installation of ethagridin lactate and prostaglandins, and you can also give oxytocin. These are all which trimester methods, guys? Second trimester medical methods: oxytocin, dinoprostol. dinoprostol is pge2 guys and you can also give carboprost carboprost pgf2 alpha now coming to the surgical methods so surgical methods may see the pictures the first one what you are seeing this is a menstrual regulation syringe it's a 50 ml syringe the second one what you are seeing this is called manual vacuum aspiration syringe how are you going to how are you going to uh, differentiate between uh, first trimester and second trimester first trimester may you have only one piston second trimester may you have two pistons third trimester is a suction and evacuation uh, sorry third picture is suction and evacuation right 
so don't give up two hours you are going to finish ops so don't give up sit and listen so menstrual regulation syringe is a 50 ml syringe you uh, it can be done only up to 6 weeks this is a opd procedure done under mild sedation you use the carbon scanner to aspirate the products manual vacuum aspiration syringe does not require electricity that's why the name is manual it has a double valve piston it uses it it creates a negative pressure of 660 mm hg it can be used up to 14 weeks this is also done under mild sedation it's a opd procedure suction and evacuation creates a negative pressure of 600 mm hg this is used up to 14 weeks it is done under short general anesthesia in all these three we use carmen scanner to aspirate the products of conception so in uh, manual vacuum aspiration syringe and suction and evacuation the gestational age will decide the size of the cannula if she is 8 weeks we will use 8 mm cannula and if she is 9 weeks also we will use 8 mm cannula so what do i mean if she is even number you will use even number cannula if she is odd number if she is having odd number gestational age then you should use one week less cannula okay 1 mm less cannula right so this is the color coded carbon cannula this is the manual vacuum aspiration syringe how did you identify it has two pistons it has two pistons the surgical methods what we have in the second trimester is dilatation and curettage and dilatation and evacuation so in dilatation and curettage first you have to check the uterine utero cervical length with uterine sound then you have to dilate the cervix with hegaz dilator then you use curette if you are using curette it is dilatation and curettage one end is sharp one end is blunt so sharp end you use for gynecological procedures blunt end you use for ops procedures this is called dilatation and curettage we also have dilatation and evacuation so for dilatation and evacuation we use the ovum forceps so it is like a cup where you use you, you used to hold the products of conceptions this is a traumatic and this doesn't have a catch guys this doesn't have a catch now let us see the question that finishes a miscarriage see this is how you have to revise hardly 8 minutes we finish such a big topic right so a 32 year old woman presents for her 12 week scan she has been pregnant once before but had a first trimester miscarriage she reports no problem with this pregnancy and has no vaginal bleeding or spotting the scan shows no fetal cardiac activity and a small gestational sac what is the likely diagnosis so what is your diagnosis guys so as the scan is showing no fetal cardiac activity what is your diagnosis here so as there is no fetal cardiac output activity it means it's a dead fetus so a dead fetus is also called as missed miscarriage so the answer here is missed miscarriage missed miscarriage right next coming to the ectopic pregnancy so most common site of ectopic is fallopian tube in the fallopian tube most common is ampulla first to rupture is isthmus last to rupture is intramural or interstitial first to rupture and earliest to rupture and most common site of rupture is isthmus by 6 weeks but last to rupture is intramural or interstitial why intramural and interstitial can go up to 12 weeks is why intramural or interstitial can go up to 12 weeks is because yes because it is supported by the uterine musculature so how do we, how do we have the presentation of ruptured ectopic ruptured ectopic fat hemopeltonium right so amenorrhea pain abdomen and bleeding per vaginum amenorrhea pain abdomen and bleeding per vaginum so which is the predominant symptom here so the predominant symptom here is pain abdomen the predominant symptom here is pain abdomen so on examination patient is in shock per abdomen you will have signs of hemopeltonium per abdomen you will have all the signs of hemopeltonium per vaginal very classical finding for ruptured ectopic is when you try to move the cervix she'll have severe pain that is called cervical motion tenderness positive that is called cervical motion tenderness positive right so next coming to the next coming to the what is the management you are going to do for ruptured ectopic you're going to do immediate laparotomy followed by self injectomy immediate laparotomy followed by self injectomy right so you have amenorrhea pain abdomen and bleeding per vaginum on examination patient will be in shock 
all the signs of hemoperitoneum will be present per vaginal cervical motion tenderness will be positive you do immediate laparotomy followed by self injectomy unruptured ectopic is like a silent bomb sitting inside the sitting inside the fallopian tube most of them are asymptomatic patient is also stable they mainly present to you with mild lower abdominal tenderness it's not a ultrasound finding it it is not a clinical finding it is a ultrasound finding hai na so when you do per vaginal examination uterus can be equal to your less than period of amenorrhea you will find a tender adnexal mass in the lateral fornix so whichever lateral fornix mein ectopic is present when you put your hand you will feel a tender adnexal mass so investigation of choice will be transvaginal sonography whereas on color doppler you will see ring of fire appearance you will see ring of fire appearance right very classical on doppler you will have ring of fire appearance now coming to the management you have three modalities of management here expectant management medical management surgical management expectant means don't do anything medical mein what is the drug of choice methotrexate so whatever the criteria for medical and expectant management ulta criteria will be for the surgical management okay so expectant management you will do when patient is ready for follow up when patient is clinically stable and pain free sac size should be less than 3.5 with no fhr beta hcg should be less than 1000 patient should be ready for follow up so what is the criteria for expectant management try to learn it guys so expectant management for unruptured ectopic is done when patient is ready for follow up when beta hcg is less than 1000 sac size less than 3.5 there should be no fhr patient should be stable and pain free when it meets all this criteria you will do expectant management when are you going to do medical management so medical management we mainly do methotrexate so methotrexate should be given when there is again the criteria for methotrexate is that should be no significant pain sac size should be less than 3.5 without fhr beta hcg should be less than 5000 patient should be ready for follow up so same criteria only beta hcg is changing less than 5000 you remember when do you do surgical management ulta to whatever we have read till now pain is present significant pain sac size more than 3.5 with fhr beta hcg more than 5000 patient not ready for follow medical management you give mainly methotrexate 50 mg per meter square you have to check for beta hcg day 2 day 4 day 7 after you give methotrexate day 2 to day 4 if beta hcg drops to 15% patient is responding if the drop in beta hcg is less than 15% you repeat one more dose maximum you can give three doses surgical may you can do self injectomy means complete removal of the tube you can do selfing gotomy what is selfing gotomy you make a incision you remove the products and then you suture it selfing gostomy means you keep it open now you tell me which is more better guys otomy ostomy or ectomy which is more better otomy ostomy or ectomy come on guys what is more better otomy ostomy or ectomy so self injectomy is the best why self injectomy is the best because self injectomy may you don't have the chance of recurrence self injectomy may you don't have the chance of recurrence so that is why self injectomy is the best so i hope you are all clear for the Uh, clear with the ectopic pregnancy so that's about the ectopic pregnancy that's about the ectopic pregnancy so uh, next coming to know the names of the other ectopics so what is the name of abdominal pregnancy so abdominal pregnancy is also called as study forts criteria how are you going to remember who will have abs guys stud like person will have abs So abdominal pregnancy is two D four's criteria. Ovarian pregnancy it's called Spiegelberg's criteria. Cervical pregnancy it is called Parman's criteria. At least remember the names. Okay. Abdominal study four's criteria. 
ovarian spiegelberg's criteria cervical pregnancy it is called parman's criteria next very 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 important and my favorite topic which might come and i am thinking it should come is pregnancy of unknown location so what do i mean by pregnancy of unknown location so when you already when ultrasound is showing a sac but sorry sorry when upt is being positive but ultrasound is not able to show the sac then we call it as pregnancy of unknown location so when you are not able to locate the pregnancy on ultrasound you should always do beta hcg if beta hcg is less than 1500 some books are giving less than 2000 some books are giving less than 1500 so choose as per your answer question matlab book okay then you repeat beta hcg every 48 hours when you repeat beta hcg every 48 hours if there is rise in beta hcg more than 63% it's a intrauterine pregnancy if the rise in beta hcg is more than 50% but less than 63% it is a ectopic pregnancy if there is a fall in beta hcg it's a biochemical pregnancy i repeat this again guys so pregnancy of unknown location is where you are going to measure where upt is positive but bachcha is not seen on the ultrasound then you have to do the serum beta hcg if serum beta hcg is less than 1500 you repeat beta hcg every 48 hours so when you repeat the beta hcg every 48 hours if the beta hcg is rising more than 63% it's called intrauterine pregnancy if the rise in beta hcg is more than 50% but less than 63% it is an ectopic pregnancy if there is a fall in beta hcg is a missed abortion it's all biochemical because it's only present in the uh, you uh, by hcg but actual sac is not present so it's called biochemical pregnancy okay done let us go to the next one a 28 year old presents in her first pregnancy at 16 weeks of gestation with severe bleeding with severe hyperemesis sorry 16 weeks see whenever you are getting a clinical scenario always see the gestational age kyunki gestational age will give us a clue her blood pressure is 150 96 with 3 plus of proteinuria her booking blood pressure was normal 110 70 Abdominal examination demonstrate that symphysofundal height is equivalent to 22 cm. So uterus is equal to your uterus is more than your uterus is less than gestational age. Very good, Roy. Excellent. So I have Roy answering it correct. So if you observe here, uterus is 16. He is 16 weeks, but uterus is more than period of amenorrhea, 22 weeks, and there is associated hyperemesis. and severe preeclampsia where do we see all this combination so i am going to discuss the topic now and i'll come back to this question again so i'm happy that you all have answered correct it is nothing but the molar pregnancy see fibroid may you will not have hyperemesis fibroid may fibroid may you will not have hyperemesis and severe preeclampsia right very good shalini so this cannot be complete miscarriage kyunki complete miscarriage mein what will happen uterus will be less than period of amenorrhea actually fibroid mein uterus can be more than period of amenorrhea but fibroid will not have associated hyperemesis and severe preeclampsia so this is nothing but the molar pregnancy so now we are going to discuss molar pregnancy which is also called gestational trophoblastic disease complete mole will have only grape like vesicles partial mole will have grape like vesicles plus fetus also right So why do we have molar pregnancy? So the path of physiology of molar pregnancy is when a empty ovum fertilizes with two sperms or a empty ovum fertilizes with one sperm which will duplicate again resulting in a zygote which is purely from the father we call it as complete ovum complete mole i repeat again empty ovum ovum containing no chromosomes fertilizes two sperms or ovum containing no no chromosomes fertilizing with one sperm which will duplicate again resulting in a zygote which is made only from the father is called androgenetic mole or a complete mole the most common karyotype for androgenetic mole or complete mole is 46xx partial mole you have chromosome also you have chromosome you have a ovum with one ovum with uh, one set of chromosomes 
this ovum with one set of chromosome fertilizing two sperms or it is fertilizing one sperm which will duplicate again so partial mole mainly has three set of chromosomes partial mole mainly has three set of chromosomes okay so uh, what is the main clinical picture again here amenorrhea bleeding for vaginum and pain abdomen what is the predominant symptom in uh, molar pregnancy amenorrhea bleeding for vaginum and pain abdomen na what is the predominant symptom here in molar pregnancy the predominant symptom in the molar pregnancy is bleeding for vaginum bleeding for vaginum if it is a complete mole uterus will be more than period of amenorrhea and uterus will be soft and dowy means like bunda hua aata partial mole mein uterus can be less than ya equal to period of amenorrhea and uh, uterus is not uh, uterus will be like normal right very good very good uh, parvez and sangeeta it is mainly bleeding which is predominant symptom investigation of choice is ultrasound where you will see this classical appearance if you get this in exam don't miss is what is this called as this is called as snow storm appearance don't miss this you have to answer it correct this is called as snow storm appearance so this is a partial mole because fetus along with the snow storm appearance is there but this is complete mole theek okay? hai complications as there is lot 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 of hcg they have excess vomiting and that is called hyperemesis alpha subunit of hcg is similar to fsh lh and tsh so it can stimulate the thyroid gland and can lead to thyrotoxicosis thyrotoxicosis alpha subunit of hcg alpha subunit of hcg will stimulate the fsh and L, as it is similar to lh it can cause bilateral theca lutein cyst what is the treatment for this bilateral theca lutein cyst nothing treat the molar pregnancy this cyst will regress by itself it can cause severe preeclampsia they can go into chorio carcinoma and they can have persistent gtd they can have persistent gtd and they can also cause pulmonary embolism while you are treating the molar pregnancy the small moles can go into the lungs and cause pulmonary embolism right so gold standard is histopathological examination what is the management management is mainly suction and evacuation if age is more than 40 years and it's a complete mole you do hysterectomy post op follow up is important you do weekly beta hcg till nil and three consecutive weeks and monthly for 6 months with upt right contraceptive of choice for this 6 months is combined oral contraceptive pills contraceptive which is absolutely contraindicated is iucd that's all this is how we have to study the topic finish that finishes the molar pregnancy right so i hope it's crystal clear of molar pregnancy to all of you right let's go to the next topic now that is hypertension so what is hypertension so hypertension is blood pressure more than 140 90 after Uh, hypertension is more than blood pressure more than 140 90 on two occasions 24 hours apart proteinuria is blood pressure uh, sorry proteinuria is 300 mg of protein in 24 hour urine collection or dipstick showing 1 plus ya 2 plus ya 3 plus ya 4 plus ya urine protein creatinine ratio showing more than 0.3 hai na now let us once discuss one question so that understand the different types of hypertensions a 32 year old has blood pressure of 150 100 at 32 weeks of gestation there is headache or blurring of vision and blurring of vision proteinuria of 3 plus her blood pressure before pregnancy is 150 90 what is the diagnosis so first i'll tell you basic so that you can answer this i think you all are aware when do you call gestational hypertension so gestational hypertension is blood pressure more than 140 90 after 20 weeks of gestation blood pressure comes back to normal within 12 weeks post delivery and there is no proteinuria in gestational hypertension now this cannot be gestational hypertension kyunki here blood pressure before pregnancy is only more what is chronic hypertension chronic hypertension is blood pressure before pregnancy Yeah, blood pressure before 20 weeks. Yeah, blood pressure after 20 weeks. 
but it is more than blood pressure is after 20 weeks but it is uh, blood pressure is coming after 20 weeks but persisting beyond 12 weeks then we call it as chronic hypertension okay next coming to preeclampsia what is preeclampsia blood pressure more than 140 90 after 20 weeks of gestation associated with plus or minus proteinuria if proteinuria is present it's mild preeclampsia in the absence of proteinuria if they have end organ damage signs like headache and blurring of vision ya uh, pulmonary edema ya liver damage ya renal damage ya platelet count decrease then you don't require proteinuria so you have two types of preeclampsia guys mild preeclampsia severe preeclampsia mild is systolic blood pressure less than 160 and diastolic blood pressure less than 110 and no end organ damage severe preeclampsia systolic blood pressure more than 160 diastolic blood pressure more than 110 and end organ damage is positive and end organ damage is positive that is severe preeclampsia okay chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia is chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia is so she is having hypertension long before now she got end organ damage yeah now she got proteinuria yeah already proteinuria was there which has increased furthermore then we call it as chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia okay now tell me one more thing guys what does hypertension plus convulsions called as hypertension plus convulsions is called as very good that's called eclampsia now what is the answer here her blood pressure before pregnancy itself is raised so this cannot be mild or severe preeclampsia because they will come only after 20 weeks there is headache and blurring of vision so end organ damage is there so what is this the answer here is chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia now if i change her blood pressure before pregnancy to 120 80 then what is your answer guys if i change her blood pressure to 120 80 then what will be your answer If I change her blood pressure before pregnancy to 120-80, then what will be your answer? Same question, but I have changed her blood pressure before pregnancy as 120-80. Yes, then it becomes severe preeclampsia. Then it becomes severe preeclampsia because although the blood pressure is before less than 160-110, there is end organ damage. Yeah, that is why it will become the severe preeclampsia. Very good. Excellent, guys. Now, why do we have uh, severe preeclampsia? Se why do we have this preeclampsia is because of the... So, normally what happens, the some of the trophoblasts will come out. They are called extravillous trophoblasts. These extravillous trophoblasts will come out and break the elastic lamina of the spiral artery and make the spiral artery more velocity and less resistance so more blood goes into the intervillous space and more blood goes to the fetus more oxygen goes to the fetus this is normal but in preeclampsia there is defective secondary wave of trophoblastic invasion because of which the spiral arteries are narrow high resistance low velocity so blood flow to the intervillous space is low when blood flow to the intervillous space is low the oxygen supply to the fetus is also low. So, the, you have defective secondary trophoblastic invasion because of which there is spiral arteries are narrow and because of the spiral artery is narrow, the blood flow to the intervillous space is also low. So, blood flow to the intervillous space is low. So, because of that, the oxygen supply to the fetus is also low, right? So, this is called defective secondary wave of trophoblastic invasion and because of all this, we have more vasoconstrictors and less vasodilators. 
so there is p2 placental insufficiency which has caused increased vasoconstrictors and decreased vasodilators and these vasoconstrictors will go into the mother circulation and cause head to toe damage and hypertension in the mother so who is the main villain in preeclampsia the main villain in hypertension in pregnancy is the baby and the placenta now guys i want you to remember what are the what are the uh, vasoconstrictors which will be more inside the what are the vasoconstrictors which are more so the vasoconstrictors which are going to be more are soluble fms like tyrosine minus 1 endoglin thromboxin a2 remember this sflt1 endoglin thromboxin a2 what are the vasodilators which are low nitric oxide placental growth factor prostacyclin nitric oxide placental growth factor prostacyclin so because of this increased vasoconstrictors head to toe you will have vasoconstriction so cerebral vasoconstriction will lead to headache and vomiting retinal vessel vasoconstriction will lead to scotoma and blurring of vision pulmonary vessel vasoconstriction will lead to pulmonary edema subcapsular below the liver capsule the small vessels start to rupture and that will cause subcapsular hematoma and that will lead to stretch of the glissens capsule and will lead to epigastric pain decreased renal blood flow will lead to oliguria most common organ damaged in preeclampsia is kidney and it will have glomerulo endotheliosis and all these symptoms guys that is headache and vomiting scotoma and blurring of vision pulmonary edema epigastric pain and oliguria all these are called as impending signs of eclampsia i hope you all understood so all this is mainly because of improper secondary wave of trophoblastic invasion vasoconstrictors are increasing vasodilators are decreasing whenever you have big placenta all this risk is possible so is smoking protective of preeclampsia or smoking causes preeclampsia guys so how can we prevent prevent uh, uh, severity of preeclampsia so prevention is mainly by giving the aspirin aspirin and you can also give calcium in those patients who are deficient of calcium so aspirin now it is 150 mg per day smoking is protective for preeclampsia kyunki smoking releases nitric oxide which is a vasodilator so how do we predict the well being of the baby so the well being well being of the baby is mainly checked by the umbilical artery doppler so first you will normally have in umbilical artery doppler systole and diastole systole diastole systole diastole systole diastole but when you have reduced diastolic flow s by d ratio will be more than 3 s by d ratio will be more than 3 then you deliver her by 37 weeks then you deliver her by 37 weeks next when you have absent diastolic flow you deliver her by 34 weeks and when you have reverse diastolic flow you deliver them by 32 32 weeks okay so absent diastolic flow uh, reduced diastolic flow deliver them by 37 weeks absent diastolic flow deliver by 34 weeks reverse diastolic flow deliver by 32 to 32 weeks drug of choice is labetalol you can also give alpha methyl dopa nifedipine nitroprusside and hydralazine but alpha methyl dopa causes postpartum depression drug of choice is labetalol labetalol so specific management is delivery mild preeclampsia you deliver them by 37 weeks severe preeclampsia you deliver them by 34 weeks and if they have severe preeclampsia with impending signs you have to do immediate delivery and you have to give them magnesium sulfate profile axis you have to do immediate delivery and magnesium sulfate profile axis right so let us see this question now a 40 year old pregnant woman presents at 32 weeks of gestation in her first pregnancy with a blood pressure of 140 90 blood pressure at the beginning of her pregnancy was 160 quantitative test indicates no proteinuria she feels well with no headache and visual disturbance first of all i want you to just tell me what is the diagnosis here what is the diagnosis here is it gestational hypertension is it mild preeclampsia is it severe preeclampsia only tell me the diagnosis first 
so this is so blood pressure before pregnancy is so this is gestational hypertension so as she is only at 32 weeks i don't want to deliver her hai na no need of giving magnesium sulfate there are no impending signs you should start giving anti hypertensives only when blood pressure is more than 140 150 100 guys but here the blood pressure was only 143 90 so no need of giving her anti hypertensives also so the answer here will be do not admit or treat hypertension no indication for blood test but monitor blood pressure weekly there was one mcq for you all which you got in your exam ki a patient presents to you with blood pressure of 140 90 what is the immediate next step you will do very good excellent guys okay you tell me this question ki if a patient presents to you with the blood pressure of 140 90 what is the immediate next step you will do If the blood pressure is more than 140 90 the immediate next step what you are supposed to do is you have to check for the proteinuria you have to check for the proteinuria so you will do dipstick that is that it was asked as an mcq guys that was asked as an mcq so that finishes a very important topic that is hypertension in pregnancy now let us go for diabetes in pregnancy so diabetes in pregnancy you have two things in diabetes in pregnancy guys one is over diabetes second is pregest over diabetes or pregestational diabetes and second you have the gestational diabetes mellitus so over diabetes is glucose intolerance before pregnancy over diabetes is glucose intolerance before pregnancy whereas gestational diabetes is glucose intolerance now in the pregnancy when do you call over diabetes when fbs is more than 126 ppbs is more than 200 and hb1c is more than 6.5 you call it as over dia print it fbs more than 126 ppbs more than 200 hb1c more than 6.5 whenever hb1c is more than 6.5 especially if it is more than 10 the risk of congenital malformation increases so the most common congenital malformation associated with over dm is ventricular septal defect more than neural tube defects most specific congenital malformation is sacral agenesis ya caudal regression syndrome most specific cardiac anomaly is transposition of great arteries so most common congenital malformation is vsd more than neural tube defect most specific is congenital malformation that is caudal regression syndrome ya sacral agenesis most specific cardiac anomaly is transposition of great arteries okay this picture they can give you in the exam and ask what is this associated with this is the most specific for over dm it's called caudal regression syndrome or sacral agenesis or sirenomelia right so in exam you should be uh, knowing that this is associated only with over dm so over dm may your main target is fbs uh, insulin is the drug of choice and you have to do fetal echo to the baby you have to do fetal echo because they are having so many risk of congenital malformation right So how do we diagnose GDM? GDM is mainly diagnosed by screening, right? So 100 grams of GTT, they should have prior fasting, uh, and then you take fasting one hour, two hours, and three hours. Fasting should be less than 95, one hour less than 180, two hours less than 150, three hours less than 140. Two values are abnormal, we call it as GDM. One value is abnormal, you call it as uh, impaired glucose tolerance. You also have 75 grams OGTT. 75 grams OGTT is fasting should be less than 92 one hour should be less than 180 two hours should be less than 153 now this class is only beneficial when you have already read the topic once because it's a rapid revision so i hope you are understanding like i'm just i'm just touching your brain ki whatever you have read these are the most important like you know high possibility that this questions will come and this is what you have to imprint in your brain that is what i'm emphasizing on right So fasting should be less than 92. One hour should be less than 180. Two hours should be less than 153. So we also have 75 grams 
OGCT that's called dipsy here irrespective of the meal status you give her 75 grams of blood sugar and then you're going to measure the sugars after two hours if it is less than 120 it is called normal 121 to 140 it is called impaired glucose tolerance more than 140 is called gdm and more than 200 is called as over dm so less than 120 is normal 121 to 140 is impaired glucose tolerance more than 140 is gdm and more than 200 is called over dm okay right next so when it is a gdm you give two weeks of medical nutrition therapy diet exercise and everything after two weeks also it doesn't subside then you have to give insulin as the drug of choice insulin is the drug of choice right thank you happy chinky thank you so much so timing of delivery timing of delivery so gdm controlled on diet you have to deliver them by 40 to 40 plus 6 weeks gdm controlled on medication gdm controlled on medication 39 to 39 plus 6 weeks and if it is a gdm control over dm control over dm or gdm which is poorly controlled then you deliver them by 37 weeks and if it is GDM or over DM uncontrolled, you have to deliver them by 34 weeks. So this is the timing of delivery. This is the timing of delivery. Okay. Controlled on medication, 39 to 39 plus 6. Controlled on diet, 40 to 40 plus 6. Poorly controlled, 37. Uncontrolled, 34. How do you decide the delivery process? So if it is according to ACOG, weight more than 4.5 kg is elective LSEs. But in India, if weight is more than 4 kg itself, you can go for elective LSEs. Why do we go for elective LSEs if weight is more than 4 kg? Because they have the risk of shoulder dystocia. So what is shoulder dystocia? Head to shoulder delivery time more than 1 minute is called as shoulder dystocia. Head to shoulder delivery time more than 1 minute is called as shoulder dystocia. So the risk factors, you can mainly remember it as dope guys, dope. That is diabetes mellitus, obesity, post-datism and excessive weight gain. Diabetes mellitus, post obesity, post-datism and excessive weight gain. Intrapartum risk factors are when they have prolonged second stage of labor, oxytocin induction and mid forceps or vacuum extraction. How do you manage shoulder dystocia? So most common risk associated with shoulder dystocia is herbs palsy. Abhishek, you are there. You wanted me to teach shoulder dystocia in particular, right? So the most common risk associated with shoulder dystocia is herbs palsy, where you have the C5, C6 getting damaged. C5, C6 getting damaged, right? So what is the first thing which you do when you have a shoulder dystocia? Call for help. Call for help. And then you bring the patient to the edge of the table. Empty the bladder. Extend the episiotomy. And then you do something called as Mac Roberts position. So what is Mac Roberts? Mac Roberts may hyperflex both the limbs on the abdomen and abduct. Hyperflex both the limbs on the abdomen and abduct. Dono pair pet ke upar and abduct. So that's called Mac Roberts position. So hyperflex both the limbs on the abdomen and abduct. Most common complication associated with Mac Roberts is Meralgia Parasthetica. That is lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh getting compressed. After Mac Roberts, we do suprapubic pressure. That is sustained rocking movements on the back of the fetus. If baby doesn't deliver by this also, then we go for Woods Corkscrew. Where you are progressively rotating the posterior shoulder to anterior shoulder to in order to remove the baby like a screw. Baby doesn't come out by that also. Then we do posterior arm extraction. So that is you put your hand inside and then pull the arm outside. If all fail, you have to make the mother lie down like a dog or a cat. That's called Gaskins and all force position and repeat all. That also doesn't help. Break the clavicle of the mother. That's called fetal clerotomy. You have break the pubic symphysis of the mother. That's called maternal symphysiotomy. You have push the fetal head inside and then you go for cesarean section. That is called Zana Veli. That is called Zana Veli. 
that's about the shoulder dystocia i repeat all the maneuvers once again please listen cautiously so first call for help bring the patient to the edge of the table empty the bladder extend the episiotomy mac roberts maneuver hyperflex both the limbs on the abdomen and abduct followed by supra pubic pressure followed by wood's cork screw followed by posterior arm extraction if all this fail put the mother like a gaskins position ya all fours position last three thing and repeat all last break the clavicle of the baby break the pubic symphysis of the mother yeah push the fetal head inside and then go for cesarean section that's called zana valley that's called zana valley right so that finishes the shoulder dystocia next coming to the twins so you have two types of twins uniovular or identical twins binovular and fraternal twins identical twins are usually 25% whereas binovular or non identical twins are 75% guys okay so binovular twins twins also you got a question guys binovular twins are formed from two zygotes two sperms two ovums and two zygotes so in kana less fighting so they have their own bedroom their own bathroom their own kitchen so they are dichorionic diamniotic chorion matlab placenta amnion means amniotic sac but monochorionic is not that way monochorionic monochorionic the division depending on the monozygotic sorry monozygotic may they are formed when one sperm fertilizes one zygote once ovum so single zygote depending on when did it split their chorionicity and amnionicity will change so if a monozygotic twin divides within 72 hours in the morula state it results in two separate placentas and two separate amniotic sac two bedrooms two kitchens so two amniotic sac two placentas so dichorionic diamniotic they gave this image once in the exam if the division takes place within four day 4 to day 8 in the blastocyst stage then they have a single placenta but two amniotic sac can you see here placenta is separate and amniotic sacs are separate second picture mein placenta is same and amniotic sacs are two so this is called monochorionic diamniotic if the division takes place after the blastocyst has implanted between day 8 to day 13 you'll have a single amniotic sac and single placenta that's called monochorionic monoamniotic if the division takes place after the embryonic disk is fused that is beyond 13 days babies also will be chipkafied that's called conjoined twins or siamese twins most commonly they are chipak with thorax or thoracophagus is the most common least common is craniophagus okay this is very important right how do you identify the twins mainly by the ultrasound this signs are very important you can get this in the image based question so if you observe this there are two gestational there are two babies and in between you are having a t sign t sign is seen in this is t sign t sign is seen in monochorionic diamniotic and if you see this one this is like a lambda so this lambda is seen in dichorionic diamniotic this lambda is seen in dichorionic diamniotic so lambda sign is seen in dichorionic diamniotic t sign is seen in monochorionic monoamniotic this is seen between 11 to 14 weeks of gestation right next coming to the very important complication what we have associated with uh, twins is twin to twin transfusion syndrome so twin to twin transfusion syndrome is seen only 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 in monochorionic diamniotic placenta twin to twin transfusion syndrome is seen only 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 in monochorionic diamniotic placenta so here there is a deep arteriovenous malformation because of this deep arteriovenous malformation there is one twin donor twin and a recipient twin donor twin is giving blood so it will be oligoan anemia the recipient twin is receiving the blood so it is polyhydramnios and polycythemia right so what is the management you have to burn this ablation burn this deep av malformation so fetoscopic laser ablation of av malformation fetoscopic laser ablation of av malformation okay 
सो डोनट विन विल हैव ऑलिगो एंड अनिमिया रेसिपियन विन विल हैव पॉली एंड पॉलिसाइटिमिया ठीक है मैनेजमेंट और टाइमिंग ऑफ डिलीवरी फॉर मोनो कोरियोनिक मोनो एमनियोटिक यू हैव टू डिलीवर देम बाय सिजेरियन सेक्शन इटसेल्फ बाय 32 टू 34 वीक्स बिकॉज़ दे हैव हाई रिस्क ऑफ कॉर्ड एंटैंगलमेंट मोनो कोरियोनिक डाई एमनियोटिक यू डिलीवर देम बाय 36 टू 37 वीक्स डाई कोरियोनिक डाई एमनियोटिक 37 टू 38 वीक्स वेरस ट्रिपलेट्स यू डिलीवर देम बाय 35 वीक्स ट्रिपलेट्स यू डिलीवर देम बाय 35 वीक्स आफ्टर गिविंग अ कोर्स ऑफ स्टीरॉइड्स that's about the twins and yes how do you decide the mode of delivery the mode of delivery is decided by the first twin if first twin is kefal ya vertex you'll always go for vaginal delivery you'll always go for vaginal delivery second twin is breech still you will do vaginal delivery so mode of delivery will mainly depend on the first twin if first twin is vertex you will do vaginal delivery Second twin is breech. You will do assisted vaginal breech delivery. Assisted vaginal breech delivery. If second twin is transverse lie, second twin is transverse lie. Then what are you going to do? If first twin is caval vaginal delivery, second twin transverse lie. then you're going to hold the baby's leg and pull it out that's called internal podalic version and then we do something called as assisted vaginal breech delivery assisted vaginal breech delivery okay so if second twin is breech you do assisted vaginal breech delivery right so mano if first twin is breech then what will you do whichever twin engages first you will call uh, first twin so if first twin is breech then what will you do If first one is breech, then you are going to go for cesarean section. Then you are going to go for LSCS. Because I told you, you can do vaginal delivery only if first one is kefal or vertex, right? So if first one is breech, very good, Arkadip, correct, LSCS. Bus. Next, coming to the labor. in labor leopold maneuvers are very very important you know they can give you image based question of leopold maneuvers so if you observe the leopold maneuvers so leopold maneuvers have to be performed between 28 to 32 weeks of gestation guys so if you see the first grip the first grip is called as fundal grip so first grip may your hands will be near the fundus if you feel near the fundus there is soft broad irregular structure it is a buttocks If you feel this hard, curved, globular, blottable, can move, separate from the body, then it is a baby's head. So first grip is called as first Leopold is called as fundal grip. Second Leopold is now coming laterally, so it's called lateral or umbilical grip. If you feel a smooth curvilinear resistance, it is the fetal back. If you feel multiple knob-like structures, then it is the fetal limbs. Third Leopold maneuver is also asked many times in exam. third leopold maneuver third leopold maneuver is called as pollix grip pollix grip so thumb on one side four fingers on the other side so you hold the baby's head and try to rotate that's called pollix grip if head is blottable then you can move it if head is blottable then it is not engaged head is not blottable then it is engaged the fourth leopold maneuver or the second pelvic grip is by you have to try to go below the presenting part if your both hands are diverging then it is head not engaged head engaged both hands are converging then head is not engaged okay now regarding the pelvis this can be asked so can you tell me what are these diameters which i am trying to show you Anybody can tell me what are these diameters which I am trying to show you? So blue, green, purple. What are these? These are called conjugate. These are the anteroposterior diameter of the inlet. So the blue one that is from the lower border of pubic symphysis to the sacral promontory. So how are you going to remember from below upwards? Remember it as dot. 
is called diagonal conjugate. From posterior surface of the pubic symphysis to sacral promontory, this is called obstetric conjugate. From the upper border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory, this is called true conjugate. So, we have diagonal conjugate, obstetric conjugate, true conjugate. So, diagonal conjugate is from lower border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. Obstetric conjugate is from posterior surface of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. From upper border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory, that is called true conjugate. So, diagonal conjugate is usually 12 centimeters. Obstetric conjugate is around 10.5 centimeters. True conjugate or anatomical conjugate is 11 centimeters. Right? Very, very good, Shalini. So, normally, this is what you have to remember for the pelvis. So, pelvis may inlet is transversely oval. Inlet is transversely oval. Whereas, cavity is circular. Outlet is anteroposteriorly oval. So, inlet may transversely oval. So, transver it is 13 centimeters. Transverse diameter. Anteroposterior is 11 centimeters. Oblique is 12 centimeters. Cavity, everything is circular, 12 centimeters. Outlet, anteroposterior diameter is the largest, 13, 12, 11. Simple. Now, once we got a question on what is this. So, there is something called plane of greatest pelvic dimension and plane of least pelvic dimension. From the posterior surface of pubic symphysis to S2, S3 is called plane of greatest pelvic dimension. From lower border of pubic symphysis to S4, S5 is called plane of least pelvic dimension which crosses across the ischial spine. The distance between these two is called as mid pelvis. The distance between these two is called as mid pelvis. Okay. Types of pelvis. We mainly have four types of pelvis. Gynecoid, Android, Anthropoid, Platypeloid. Last exam they just give you, gave you this picture and they asked what type of pelvis it is. Gynecoid is circular and most common type of pelvis guys. Gynecoid is circular and most common type of pelvis. Subpubic angle is more than 90 degrees. Ischial spines are not prominent. It is very good for labor. Anthropoid. A, P. Anthropoid. It is anthroposterially oval. Ischial spines can be plus or minus positive. This will have persistent OP position, non-rotation and face to pubis delvi. Android is triangular, triangular, yeah, heart shaped. It, pubic angle is less than 85 degrees. Ischial spines are prominent. This favors OP position and deep transverse arrest. Platypeloid is transversely oval, least common and this mainly presents face presentation. This is how you have to revise only the key points. So, please tell me which pelvis is this? This looks like round. So, it is gynecoid. Second one, if you see it is anthroposterior oval. So, what did strike in your brain? Anthropoid. Third one is like a heart. So, this is android. Fourth one is transversely oval. This is platypeloid. Yeah, cardinal movements of labor can be asked to us. So, cardinal movements of labor... The first cardinal movement is head getting engaged, engagement. After the head gets engaged, it goes on going down, that is descent. Then head will undergo further flexion. Then internal rotation. Then baby's head is trying to stretch the perineum, that's called crowning. Then delivery of the fetal head will be by extension, restitution and external rotation. So please remember the cardinal movements. First engagement, descent. Flexion, internal rotation, delivery of the fetal head by extension. One eighth rotating back is restitution. Another one eighth rotating back is external rotation. So that's the cardinal movements of labor, right? Now coming to the stages of labor. How many stages of labor do we have? So we have four stages of labor. First stage is from the onset of true labor pains to full dilatation. So, first stage is from the onset of true labor pains to full dilatation. Latent phase according to WHO is less than 4 cm. Active phase is 4 to 10. According to recent WHO, according to recent WHO, it is less than <coughs> 5 cm and 5 to 10 cm. That's called WHO labor care guide. According to Williams, latent phase is less than 6 cm, active phase is 6 to 10 cm. Yeah, I know this is a controversy. Like each body has different thing to stay, say, right? 
now very very important please concentrate although this is the last but i want you to concentrate here because these tables are important primary me on an average latent phase will take 10 to 12 hours whereas multi it will take 6 to 8 hours prolong latent phase in primary is more than 20 hours prolong latent phase in multi is more than 14 hours and when you have prolonged latent phase nothing to do just wait and watch so primary latent phase is average 10 to 12 hours multi 6 to 8 hours prolonged latent phase is more than 20 hours and more than 14 hours in multi treatment just to wait and watch active phase so active phase may again two things the rate of dilatation and the rate of descent primary the rate of dilatation is 1.2 cm per hour whereas multi it is 1.5 cm per hour rate of descent 1 cm per hour and 2 cm per hour when do you call prolonged active phase your protracted active phase whenever it is take and according to who everything is minimum 1 cm per hour so whenever it is taking more time than what we have written there then we call it as prolonged your protracted active phase you reel out op position because it takes more time cpd will never come out go for cesarean you have to rule out and then when you rule out these, you can do artificial rupture of membrane and give her oxytocin to augment the labor. Active phase arrest means labor has come to an arrest in the active phase. So prerequisites for active phase arrest is cervix should be more than 6 cm dilated. Membrane should be absent. With adequate contraction, no dilatation for 4 hours. With inadequate contraction, you give oxytocin. And no dilatation for 6 hours is called active phase arrest. The treatment for active phase arrest is LSCS. The treatment for active phase arrest is LSCS. Okay. So let us see this question. A 28 year old in her first pregnancy is induced at term plus 10 days. The CTG was normal before labor. She was dilated for 6 centimeters 4 hours previously. Now she is dilated to 8 centimeters on vaginal examination. So what happened? She is 6 centimeters dilated 4 hours and now is 8 centimeters. So the rate of dilatation is less than 1 centimeter per hour. So this is prolonged or yeah, protracted active phase. So this is nothing but prolonged or yeah, protracted active phase. She has uterine contractions at a rate of 2 every 10 minutes. The CTG shows a baseline heart rate of 150 beats per minute. Good variability and infrequent shallow variable decelerations. What is the most ne next appropriate action? So what you have to do here? So you want to augment the labor, right? See, as the labor is going slow, what do you want to do? You have to augment the labor. And how do you augment the labor? So you augment the labor by starting the syntocinon and assess in two hours, right? So next let us go to the second stage. So second stage, on an average in primary it will take 1 hour. In multi it will take 30 minutes. Prolonged second stage is 2 hours. Second stage arrest in 3 hours. So second stage is from full dilatation to expulsion of the fetus. Second stage is from full dilatation to expulsion of the fetus. So primary it will take 1 hour. Prolonged second stage 2 hours. Second stage arrest 3 hours. So how are you going to remember? 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. Multi it will be half. 30 minutes. 1 hour. 2 hour. Prolonged second stage is 1 hour. Second stage arrest is 2 hours. So normally we deliver the baby by Ridgeon's method. That is perineal support and deliver the fetal head by flexion. If it is prolonged second stage, you have to see the station of the fetal head. The station is above plus 2. Then go for LSCS. Station is below plus 2, you can do instrumental delivery. And if it is second stage arrest, everywhere where arrest comes, you go for LSES. With epidural, you have to add one more hour to whatever we have written here. With epidural, you have to add one more hour to everything what we have written here. Right? So, what is the third stage? Third stage is expulsion of the placenta. So, third stage expulsion of placenta, you mainly have two components. Expectant management and active management. So third stage, when you are doing active management, placenta comes out within 5 minutes, both in primary and multi. 
placenta comes within 15 minutes in both primary and multi if you are doing passive management and if you are doing management for beyond if the placenta does not come out beyond 30 minutes you call it as retained placenta you call it as retained placenta so what do you do in active management of third stage of labor idbi so injection oxytocin d for delayed cord clamping B for Brandt's Andrew method, I intermittent uterine tone assessment. Uterus is flabby, then you can go for uterine massage. I repeat, what are the components of active management of third stage of labor? You can remember it as IDBI. I stands for injection of uterotonic drugs. It can be either oxytocin or methergine or misoprostol. Oxytone is 10 units IM or IV. Methergine 0.2 milligrams, misoprostol 600 micrograms per rectal. Yeah, per vagina. Delayed cord clamping, you have to wait the, for the cord pulsation to stop and then clamp the cord. Control cord traction, you have you do Brandt's Andrew method where one hand on the abdomen with another hand you hold the cord and try to pull it out. If you don't keep your abdominal hand, then uterus can come, come out. That's called inside out turning of the uterus, that is uterine inversion. Uterine tone assessment, when uterus is flabby, if you are trying to massage, that is the uh, uterine tone assessment. So that is about the active management of third stage of labor. So please remember it is not just oxytocin we can give. You can either give methergine yeah, you can either give misoprostol. Right? So that is about the complete observation where we have done all important topics. A quick recap. All important topics. A quick recap. I think one top, two topics I would feel like you have to have a quick go through is PPH and uh, you know eclampsia. So these are the two topics I feel yes, uh, once you have to go through about, uh, but rest everything I've covered, whichever are important for us. So I hope this session was useful for all of you and you have learned a lot from this session. And yes, you can do follow me. You can put your queries and do follow me on my Instagram ID. So my Instagram ID is Dr. Ramyasri7. And my Telegram group name is Dr. Ramyasri Abgain Pack. Dr. Ramyasri Abgain Pack. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we are going to have fun filled learning of Gynec. A quick recap of Gynec also. So, once go through whatever you have learned previously and then come to the class, it will be quick recap of the Gynec. And I am going to cover everything in Gynec also in a beautiful manner and finish your Gynec. Okay. So, thank you so much, Roy. Thank you so much. I am happy that uh, it was helpful. Thank you so much. So, I will see you all tomorrow again. I will see you all tomorrow again. So, where we will discuss the gynec uh, session. Right. Thank you guys. Bye. Take care. See you.